Thank you guys all for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Jessica Davey. I'm the president of our American Institute of Professional Geologists student chapter here at Metro State. And we are very honored to have Ken Witherly here with us this evening for our event. Um, just read a little bit about Ken here. Uh, he graduated from UBC, Vancouver, Canada, with a BS in geophysics and physics in 1971. Uh, he spent the next 27 years with the Utah BHP Minerals Company, during which time as chief geophysicist, he championed BHP's programs in airborne geophysics, which resulted in the development of the Megaton and Falcon technologies. In 1999, Ken helped form a technology-focused service company that specializes in the application of innovative processing and data analysis to help drive the discovery of new mineral deposits. Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> Glad to be here. I must thank uh, Tom as well. He hooked me in. It was one of those interesting stories where I've been a member of the a AIPG for, I don't know, five or six years, and, uh, and they finally found us. We have an office out in, uh, in Lakewood, and they said, oh, would you guys like to run an advert in our, in our journal? And uh, I said, yeah, I guess we could do that. We, I'm not really a big fan of, of print advertising because I find that most of our clients uh, actually have lost the ability to read, at least intelligently, <laughs> unless they actually want something. Um, so uh, anyways, I, I, uh, uh, I, I placed the ad. I don't think I've actually seen it yet. It's maybe downloadable. But then Tom said, oh, I went to your website. You guys do a whole bunch of neat stuff. And I said, would you be interested in giving a talk? And that's one of the things I chatting with people beforehand that I actually have um, do a fair number of talks these days and a lot of them to geological audiences. The last major one was at the Keystone Conference, maybe some of you were at last year. And there was a room of about 600 people in the, in the room. And I had to ask the question, I say, I'm not a recovering alcoholic, but I am a geophysicist by original training. How many geophysicists were in that room? And about three people put their hands up, and I figured they were cleaning staff who had snuck in and didn't know what the word geophysicist meant. There's <laughs> a reason not to get kicked out. So I will assume most of you are geologists in preparing this talk, which is good, or aspiring geologists. Um, the spin on this, and I had, uh, I guess, a fair bit of freedom, uh, was about careers looking in minerals exploration. And um, this is... Uh, as I was mentioning, is, is Google's great. You can go in and you can pull up all sorts of amazing images, and I found this beautiful one, and say, well, after the storm, and then they sort of say, well, what's the storm? So I'm going to go through some steps about what the industry, where it is right now, how it's maybe gotten there in the past decade, a little bit about myself, um, and then some ideas about what I see as, as um, some guidance, potentially, that could be provided to people that are looking out into the industry. And I could just say, you know, it also caused me to go back and examine my career. And I realized I didn't know Jack when I went through university, right? And I'll show you my little two-piece bit about how I got into geophysics. It's really like, boy, this guy must have been passionate. But anyways, there's always a commercial with these things. And I think this is a good one. One of the things that will come out in the, um, in the rest of the presentation is a number, and that's one of the interesting things, for me anyways, that when I was putting this together, uh, having been in the business for as long as I have, I have a fairly large network of what I call colleagues, and, and some of them are friends, but certainly people that you know, I find interesting and respect their opinion. And about three weeks ago, I polled about 80 of these people on a weekend. And within two hours, I had multi-page documents appearing on my computer. These people had punched back replies. Enormous interest, all about the question in the abstract that I sent out. What's going on? What can we tell the young people coming into the business? There was an enormous interest. And it's, it's interesting because it doesn't really get captured in many forms, I don't think. It's something which these people who have been in the business, and I, I sort of came up with a figure, I said there's 2,500 years of experience that got into this talk, uh, all because of my, my extended family. 
And uh, one of the things that comes out of it, is to start, tied in with this, is the, uh, the pursuit of, of excellence and speciality, particularly in the areas of data integration. And this is something which uh, many meetings now have got as actual theme, but it's one of those things, it's like world peace. Lots of people talk about it, but it's often very difficult to find solid examples of what it actually means. Some uh, colleagues and I got together uh, a few years ago to honor a, um, a friend and colleague of ours, Frank Hernot, who was one, truly one of the pioneers in, in computer visualization in uh, exploration. Uh, Frank, like myself, started off with the geophysical background, but he became very much a generalist and an entrepreneur. He was building software and selling it. Uh, we were an agent for his, and we started a contest which this is the first slide, and you can go to the website. And we have a prize, and we have money, and we're going to take people to a meeting. But to try and come up with something tangible, putting data together, and this is not just geophysical data, there's geophys uh, geochemistry, geology, drilling information. So we came up with the idea we would put test sites together. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, we've got a cat two categories. We call it apprentice, which a lot of you in this room would qualify as, and then more experienced people, um, maybe you know, more seasoned hands like myself who are currently underemployed, who might want to play with some data. And uh, we're, we've, the data's come out uh, a few months ago, and you ha people have until the end of next year to make submissions. We've got five excellent blocks of data, one from British Columbia in the Quinell Trough, Calcalic Porphyry Terrain, one in the Yukon, excuse me, plateau. Uh, enough, that's our fairly major Greenfields regional project. MDRU has spent some time on that one. Uh, First Quantum very kindly donated their entire data set over the Kavitsa deposit. This is an operating nickel copper PGE mine in northern Finland. Uh, then we have the Broken Hill area, donated uh, data donated by the um, New South Wales Geological Survey. And finally, uh, we have what's called the Woomera Restricted Area. It's basically a large block northwest of the uh, Olympic Dam deposit. So very similar terrain in the Galler Craton. So you can download these data sets. They're available now from Geosoft at no cost. And then put them together, and we'll have a panel of judges looking at them uh, beginning of 2017. Uh, decisions we made as to the you know competition as the quality of the uh, entries and then we'll be making the awards at the 2017 decennial meeting in Toronto in October and handing out some some checks so yeah well that's Canadian dollars but we're trying to get <laughs> can't uh, can't help that so anyways um, the talk so what is it? Minerals exploration. I had to sort of, without trying to be condescending about it, I thought, okay, let's define a few things that sort of at the beginning. Uh, so we got a kind of a common framework. Um, and I just called it the search for new economic mineral deposits. Um, most of the time, of course, we actually don't find that. It's very rare to find an economic deposit. And one of the unfortunate things is, is a lot of companies make the assumptions when they find something and it may be economic at a particular time at a particular price and it may be related to energy costs, it may be related to payments to governments or indigenous people, that deposit can become uneconomic at a particular point in time too. It's not a guarantee by any means. So I haven't put it in the text but some companies say well we really want to find what they call tier one deposits which were basically be profitable through the entire economic cycle. These are percentages of where expiration funds are currently being spent. I think this is a 2013 snapshot from uh, SNL. They're, they're basically a big data broker in this sort of uh, this space. Canada's got uh, 14, you can read them, seven scattered through. Africa's often lumped together. It's certainly not uniform. There's not a lot of exploration in Sudan currently. You can understand, but there's a number of countries there. Australia gets another big chunk. 
There is a fair bit being spent in China. It's reported, but it's all being done by government companies. So you really, if you're in China, you could probably get work with them, but you're probably not going to be able to come into the country and work there. I do have a colleague, though, Noel White, who I work with in BHP, and he is actually a teacher and mentor at one of the universities in China. So technically, he's involved. He's in the system, but in a slightly more circuitous route. The major players in the business. Um, there's a bit of lumping here, but the majors are typically large publicly traded companies who will have a number of deposits and produce a variety of mineral types. They're the kind of the BHPs, the Rio Tintos, Anglo-Americans, the Glencores of the world. These are, there used to be an effort to put market cap brackets around them, but I think just that probably, those words are a pretty good description. Juniors are a little bit more difficult to categorize. Some people throw the term intermediate in, but that's kind of a dodge. Basically, these would be companies that I consider have a limited amount of production, one or two deposits, and then companies which draw their entire financial support from the markets, either through investors, private investors, or the stock market. So these are the people you would most likely, in the economic geological world, seek to find employment with. And they are currently in massive turmoil which you probably knew, but I will try and give you elucidation as to, it's not that bad, but boy, a lot of people have said it looks pretty tough. And we as often is the case, some of these are external events that cause this, and some of these very much so are self-wrought. Back, this is actually steps back to almost when I started in the business, interesting, but the part that I just wanted to focus on was really from about 2000 going forward. The red is the expenditure line. The kind of taupe is the discoveries. You can see we had a real steep climb. There was a bit of a drop in the uh, uh, credit crunch, I think in 08, financial crisis, but it came back very, very quickly and topped out at, at um, over 20 billion US dollars spent. And then that red line, just keep drawing that straight down towards the zero. It's almost extinguished. The monies being spent by many companies now are simply to keep the lights on for the juniors. They're not actually doing any real work. They're just paying minimum salaries, they're, they're doing their, their stock exchange uh, fees and things like that. So, but you can see down the rest of the curve, it's kind of, you know, up and down like, a, like one of those stationary bicycles. You can have your little path, right? You can go up, down, and up and down. That is the nature of the business. There's always been a cyclicity to prices, income, and expiration expenditures. Because typically, majors will not spend money unless they're making money. Uh, but some of them will spend if they can, even in, when times are tough. We've got a client right now, they were operating a, a mine up in Ontario, and we got a contract with them the same week that they announced they were laying off 43, job, 43 people at the mine. So they clearly have a vision that they need to do exploration to survive in the future, and they'd rather let some truck drivers and shovel operators go, because they, they will come back when the prices come up, they will come back. But the expiration, if you don't do it, you miss an opportunity. So this leads us into the second point. Where are the discoveries? Because this is in part which has compounded the problem we have now, is that many investors believe, we gave you all this money, and what happened? You pissed it away. You didn't give us anything back. That's not totally true for every company. But it's a sentiment that is really ingrained with a lot of people that, that felt stunk who invested in the mining business. There was probably, of 10 major companies, I can think at least seven have had their CEOs removed in the last three years. Decapitations across the board. Junior companies, they just disappear because the money runs out. The major companies, they take them out and shoot them. 
And then they appear in another company later and say, hey, I'm here going to be a hero. <laughs> These guys definitely have got Kevlar briefs. <laughs> Type of expiration expenditures. When the juniors did well, they were very, very competitive in terms of dollars into the ground. And this is over that critical period. You can see uh, the majors in blue, the juniors in the, in the lime colored, and then the intermediates would, I lumped them in with the juniors, and then government and other, uh, like Codelco in Chile, privately owned, it's owned by the government. So they spend money in expiration, but it's really, um, it's really a government organization. But now, if we had the statistics, which we, we still, at this point, the talk was given in 14, but he didn't have the numbers, we would see that lime colored line drooping big time. The blue would have come down, but the, the lime colored one would, would be very, very low. And of course, if they're not spending money, there's not jobs for people. Here's the market cap, another way of, ca uh, of and, uh, capturing, the, call it the pain. These are the big five, BHP, Real, Valet. Valet's um, iron ore and uh, nickel. Rio Tinto was multi-element. BHP's iron ore, copper. Um, Glencore, coal. And uh, AA is, is Anglo-American. You can just see some of them. Ang uh, Glencore and Anglo, a couple of weeks ago I read, if you look at their debt and you look at their market cap, they're almost insolvent. Because this doesn't show debt, this just shows what the market capitalization is. They are really working hard to rewrite themselves, and they will. The juniors, this is a, I apologize, it's a little dodgy to look at, but this is money they basically have been able to raise, financing. And you can see going off in the, the quarter three of 2013, it's going down big time. The blue is uh, debt financing, that's still. That's a significant part coming in, but equity financing has really, really gone down. So that, um, that means it's been very tough for people currently in the business, and it certainly is tough for people trying to come into the business. But these things don't last forever. Greed wins out. It does. People want to make money, and investment in mining companies, certainly in juniors, has been a way for many people to make a lot of money. Not everybody does, but you go to Vegas with not the thought worrying about the guy next to you winning money. It's you you want to win. And so there's a lot of people giving advice to how to do this sort of stuff. So a bit about who does the work in expiration. Historically, uh, the majority of the geoscientists were right of uh, here in Canada, Britain, Australia, and South Africa. So it's sort of a, an English-speaking clique but it's changing. There's a lot of very good people uh, elsewhere in the world getting educated. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Jeremy Richards, who's done work, and he's a prophet at um, Edmonton. He said there's just thousands and thousands of exploration geologists graduating in China. They're all staying in there right now. And he says, right now, they're not world class, but they're learning. He says, they're learning quickly. And then, you know, like with the petroleum, they'll be unleashed in the rest of the world. The Japanese sort of tried that, and they're never very successful. It's interesting. BHP, uh, the year I left, or they left me? How do you describe that? <laughs> Anyways, we had 42 offices, 750 staff, over 20 countries. Now they have two offices and less than 20 people. They are the largest mining company in the world, and that's their complement. Now, they do hire contractors if you pass their safety tests. But it's, it's a definitely a different world. Juniors, on the other hand, they tend to not have permanent staffs, but they can be very aggressive on hiring, and they'll pay very well, but you're out doing very specific tasks for them over relatively, call it a field season, simple way of putting it. You go out and you know, log drill chips or log core, um, all that sort of good stuff, do mapping. Um, to do more mapping. So, and BHP right now would be not unrepresentative of a lot of the companies. I mean, they still have, there's a few that seem, still seem to have their act together. First Quantum is one, but they've had some cuts. They've had some definitely some problems with their copper production. Um, 
Tech is trying to hold it together. Uh, Rio Tinto, they have a, uh, they seem to be able to be keeping their, their keel in the water as far as expiration. But they're definitely in a minority. But they may serve as a, as a guidepost for when the financial turmoil gets settled out. Because everybody likes to copy the successful groups, right? It's inevitable. If they see those guys being successful, they're going to say, I want to be like Mikey. That's just the way people work. There's not a lot of models out there and say, well, we better beef up expiration again. My gosh, that sounds like a great idea. Anyways, I put this um, set of numbers together this afternoon and I sent it to two colleagues. Um, uh, one was in shock. <laughs> That's Brian Holt. He's director of the SEG down in Littleton. But Murray Hitzman says, yeah, that looks about right to me. So that's, there's more dog catchers in America than there are economic geologists in the world. Okay, Just so get yourself a perspective as to who's important in the scheme of things. But we go after really big dogs. You know, sort of like weird dogs, you know, stuff like that. Um, can't, can't touch the former Soviet Union and China. Uh, although we are doing a bit of work for um, foreign companies working in Russia, and there are some of the oligarchs have functioning privately held companies. They're not really publicly traded, but they're not government uh, in Russia. China, no idea. Okay. So, there was my crowdsourcing effort. I was impressed. A lot of people, as I said, put a lot of time and effort into looking at, uh, and it, the range of opinion was interesting because a, a few of my comments in the abstract, maybe not to you, but to, to these colleagues were provocative. Like, they all, all of them think mentoring is happening. But a lot of them said, you're absolutely right. It's just, it's not taking place in the way it should. Part of the reason there is the majors have gone. We used to do mentoring inside large companies as a matter of organic necessity. But when more and more people are outside large companies, it's harder and harder. And you know anybody kind of my age, well not anybody, but many, social media, yet. You know, there's going to be no Twittering or Facebook or anything like that. This is not working. One guy said, well, you've got to go down to a dregs meeting, you know, and hang out and, you know. Strike up a conversation with some old fart. Yeah, right, okay. Way to go, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a point there that I think is, 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 is uh, one to focus on. If you want to get a mentor, you're going to have to be proactive about it. You're going to have to find out what you think you need and try and find somebody who can provide those skills. A colleague of mine, she got, her, got a PhD at uh, Mines a couple years ago, and she's out with a large company in Perth. She has two mentors. She's basically, I won't say she stalked them, but she has a very clear idea. She says what, what I need, and she says what she needs. Neither of her mentors are from inside her company, and it's a large company. She says, because they don't have the skill sets that I need. And I thought, what? Yeah, that, that, that's, I mean, I went 27 years in BHP, and I never was mentored. I was, you know, somebody bitch slap me occasionally, said, don't do that again, you know, that's not safe. <laughs> Bad geophysicist. But uh, mentors just didn't exist in the vernacular at that point. But be, be proactive about it. Um, anyways, the uh, Bardos is one of the few, and I gave Jessica a stick that you're welcome to upload. It's a, it's, he gave a paper at the uh, Keystone in 06 which I didn't, I attended the meeting, but I didn't attend his talk. And then he gave a talk at Mines in 2013 where he updated it a bit. And of course caught uh, some of the economic turmoil that was happening. In 06, we were really riding up. In 13, of course, it all uh, kind of slowed down considerably. So what is happening? I put this into the um, um, abstract. And there were some good comments that came back from some of them, and I've sort of qualified a few of them a bit here. The basic statements, I think, are still the same. Chronic shortage is the baby boomers are exiting. Uh, the lack of, of transition, mentoring, carrying on. Those people will be, you know, it's not like the door is going to close at, at 3 p.m. In, in 
five years or something. But interestingly, the oil industry recognized this issue and started about a decade ago to basically deal with that issue and get more students in. You look, the other SEG, Society of Exploration Geophysicists, which I'm also a member of, in front of every annual meeting, they have major events for students. It's embarrassing what the mining companies ignore, the oil companies embrace. Because they know they have to put the young people in the same work environment as the people that will be leaving in five to ten years. Don't do that in the minerals business yet. Um, lack of quality assets is an issue. Um, it used to be the, the rule of thumb was one in a thousand prospects could be turned into a mine. And some a little bit more analysis, some smart guys looked at that and said, oh, but only one in 20 of those actually makes money through the life of the mine. The rest are actually loss makers for a period of time. So finding a good deposit is, is, is rare and it can bump. There's a lot of existing resources out there of marginal grade. They get logged in as being part of the global resource, but if you could find something with three or four times the grade in the same sort of jurisdiction, you'd be a, you'd be a hero. And people are still looking for those. Ties in with the long-term uh, poor financial returns. Uh, people are looking for better deposits. And then just the, you know, there's more and more people. I mean, China's going through a, uh, a bit of a step change in its economic growth. But as they say, the base level in China is so huge, it doesn't really matter whether it's 6.5 or 7% growth. It's huge. They're, they're absorbing a lot. There are some things they're going to have to deal with, I understand, internally. They have over, they've overbuilt. They've stockpiled. They have a lot of... Uh, Fairly poor producers, they produce at very high cost, but they seem to be protected, the banks have been giving them money. There's going to be a big shake out there, which is going to be an opportunity for somebody. I'm not sure if that's, if it's us. Um, first point then was the decline in new graduates was maybe recaptured or refocused in the idea that there was this difficulty of the transition between the people going out with all the experience. And I always have this as a bit of a, I won't say it's a joke, but I, I sort of, a little bit of mirth. I said, these are all the people that spent that hundred or eighty billion dollars in the last decade and didn't find anything. We want their experience? I mean, they're the ones that push, shot us in the foot. But anyways, this, these are the folks. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to take the parts that are good, you think are actually valuable. In some parts it's, hey, yeah, yeah, you know, man. <laughs> you should have gone out of the porch with a lemonade a long time ago. <laughs> Anyways, so this maybe is the issue, is rather than an enormous decline in new graduates, it's getting the right sort of people into the business with the right training, given the, 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 the state of particularly the major companies, which used to be the incubator for many of the people that are now the baby boomers, like myself. Heading out the door. Lack of quality assets, it's not an across the board issue. I would say in the gold space, where during normal years about 40% of the expiration dollars get spent, and you can equate that to employment, uh, they are really facing a tough time. Pretty well every major gold company is producing more than they're finding right now. Gold deposits typically take 10 years from discovery to be put in production. Most gold deposits produce for 10 years. So it's, it's basically the day you start a new mine, you need to be finding its replacement because it's going to take you that long to get the permitting in place, all of that stuff that just is required. It doesn't matter whether you're in Nevada or Burkina Faso. Everywhere has got rules now. And the NGOs are watching everywhere, which is good. Keep us honest. So purchasing assets. Has worked historically. There was a thing just recently. Ken Ross and another company picked up some stuff from Barrick in Nevada. Will they make money on it? They book ounces. They, whether they're going to make money on it or not actually isn't looked at in the short term. The investors want to see those, those ounces in their, in their treasury. So diamonds is another interesting one. In that case, they have an interesting paradigm, of course, is that the beers is marketed diamonds are forever and natural's best. They're, talk, they're talking about making diamonds now. 
It, it's been, they've been doing that since the 50s. When we were part of General Electric, I saw the original machine in Schenectady, New York. It's about three stories tall, and it had this glass portal, this 10-inch thick glass portal, where they had the crucible and the graphite electrodes. And this, this they weren't using it anymore. It's like a Smithsonian piece, right? Big crack in this big 10-inch thick glass. He says, it slipped one day. Because, of course, they push it, and they run to like 1,000 amps through this puppy. And they said, you know, they said, oh, man, you make these industrial diamonds. That's really cool. But you can't make big diamonds, right? I said, what do you mean you can't make big diamonds? we got a freaking nuclear reactor down at Billy Boyle. You know, an executive retires. He gets a, you know, a three-carat cuff link, and she gets ear pendants, right? We can, we can do whatever we want. It's just a matter of economics. And that was back in the 50s. So... Um, cop base metals, it's a little bit different story. Uh, it varies depending on different companies, what assets they have. Um, you know, for uh, zinc seems to be on the up, uptake. P uh, copper is primarily the, either the porphyries around the world or the uh, sedimentary style deposits in the African copper belt. Those are the two major sources. And each one of those areas kind of has issues. I mean, the DRC is not the best place to have a mine, but people are mining there. It's sort of like you're on the edge, but in a week's time, or a month's time, or a year's time, that three and a half billion dollar asset may be zeroed out, and there's squat you can do about it. Take it to the world court. Ten years later, <laughs> what happens? So, iron ore and coal, I would say, and part of the message is that if you want experience, go in and work in an operation. There's not really much glamour in looking for iron ore or coal, but it's very good experience from the point of view of actual working at a mine. And that's something my colleagues also made a point that if, you know, your heart might be an exploration, but if you can work at a mine, you can begin to understand things that'll help you for your entire career. And might as well work at an iron mine. Sounds good. Poor long-term financial rule of thumb. This is the one I said, you know, one in a thousand. Um, finding quality assets is still on everybody's mind. I mean, it's like, how would I say, you know, nobody's, if you asked, I think if you asked a number of the major mining executives, what do you think about your assets? They would say, well, I inherited some real dogs, you know, and I can't really get a better one up, but we have to keep, we have to keep going, right? But if we could find an Escondida or an Oriol Tolgoy or something like that, man, I would sell my other stuff in a, in a blink. So if you can help people find things like that, they, if they've got a, a passion and money, it can be very interesting. Um, and I think that's just a sort of a motherhood statement. Um, but one of the things that gets thrown around is when they talk about global assets, Pebble. Over 100 million ounce gold deposits. It's the largest undeveloped gold deposit in the world. It'll probably not be mined in your children's time. I'm talking to young people here. It is just it is not a good idea from what I've seen. There's just too much that could go wrong. Even one of the guys that, that, that I hired who worked at Anglo, he says, it's in, impossible to think that they could put that in production and not damage that environment. It's just the Arctic is very fragile and the fish, and the people. So a lot of those assets that are in the book, you can rule them out. They'll never be mined. So you have to think about the ones that actually have the social license, the economics, the metallurgy, and the rest of it. So the macro scale factors are that we need minerals exploration. But this churn that's happening right now, corporate governments, social license, and until the industry as a whole reaches a degree of stability, and it's seldom that we have the majors and the juniors and the commodity markets all in this turmoil at the same time. And yet, you know, I'm not even thinking about the oil industry. It's sort of in a sort of parallel, it's over capacity um, for slightly different reasons. It's, it's probably a simpler story, but the pain, I'm sure, for explorers is still pretty high. I heard the, the last SCG meeting in New Orleans was pretty quiet. Not many people got the nod to go to that one. The junior sector, 
A lot of loss of, of um, confidence from investors, individual and institutional. There is money out there. The money hasn't disappeared. It's the confidence in investing it has disappeared. So, anyways, you can overcome that. And one of the things I know is interesting in a few conferences that I've been to where we exhibit, the investment guys like to talk to people like me because we deal with numbers. We deal with modeling. We deal with, I think to say it, reality. And they, they're very curious because every geologist has the next best property. They all have the same spiel. Whereas we sit there as more, a, a little bit dissociated from that. We actually comment about what we see in the ground and what we think it is, what the size is, what the depth is. And this guy was like, whoa, you can tell that? I never knew that. You know, I just listened to all these geologists and it's just like, wow. So there is a lot of interest in people that can quantify their ideas. And I think this next generation coming out you will have opportunities to use tools that all those baby boomers really never were able to touch. It's a combination of the big data, uh, algorithms out there, visualization platforms. There's a whole bunch of things that will empower people to do stuff that just, you know, it's Google type stuff, really. And it's part of what we need to do to innovate, to bring that in. You might not find a lot of it at the university level either. One of the things about, um, I was talking with a few people before I started yakking here, and this, is, this just sort of summarizes in a, in a simple graphic. More and more of the deposits are getting deeper, and it means that a lot of the things that people used historically, the prospecting, the field mapping, are not unimportant, but the things you're looking for, if they're down three or 400 meters under a layer of limestone or volcanics, you ain't going to see them. Geochemists will try and come up with a signature, and more power to them. We need every tool we can, we can apply. But a lot more, like in the petroleum industry, a lot more reliance is actually to be on geophysics. Geophysics is your friend. Doesn't matter what they say here. So what got this dude into the business? Guy had hair. You know, <laughs> bowing in front of a volcano in Chile. Yeah, it's free. Don't, don't erupt, don't erupt. Anyways, true story. End of my uh, spring of my first year at UBC, I had taken science and I had taken one geology course. It was really good. A guy called Danner, and he had all these freaking slides. His, his TAs were at, I'm sorry, they were unpleasant people. But the professor was really good. Uh, so I had a little bit of exposure to geology through that. I had to have an elective. And um, it had to be science, I had English as well. But you go down to the placement office. And there were two little post-it cards up on the wall that caught my attention. And one had that number, and the other one had that other number. And what did they mean? Well, that one was larger. I could figure that part out. I was pretty good on the math. <laughs> and that was summer employment. The geologist was getting 425. The geophysicist got 450. I went into geophysics based on those parts. <laughs> I'm serious. I had no, my, 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 uh, both, both grandparents were, were wheat farmers in, in Saskatchewan. My dad was a teacher. Nobody was in the business. I had no guidance. But I said, I could think I could do that. Now, one of the things that um, I found fun was sort of, if you read the Bardo stuff, I don't know how many people have even seen it before, but it is a bit of an interesting read. He's... Strength. He still works and lives here in Denver for Anglo Shanti. But even though I had a block of 27 years with technically with one company, but every three to four years there was a bump in the road. There was a change. I moved. I changed my role, and in part, but but there were a lot of people within the organization who stayed here their entire career where I started out in Vancouver, and I'm sure they had an interesting time of it. But I had a wonderful time. It was great. I got to, you know, travel the world, do a whole bunch of different, well, Reno was interesting. That's where my first kid was born. <laughs> Toronto, I spent uh, 13 years there, but there were three major job changes. Then I moved to the head office in San Francisco, two years in Melbourne, Australia, back to San Francisco, where they closed the office in 99. BHP had a major cock up. They bought Magma Copper, and they developed a hot briquetted iron system in Port Hedland that failed to work. So they made, at the time, two major and two or three minor investment decisions 
The chairman and the managing director were both fired. And they closed the office I was in, which was part of the old Utah GE group. And then I discovered entrepreneurship. This is one of the lines that a lot of the people were saying in recommendations. You gotta be an entrepreneur. You gotta have passion. I thought, well, I have infatuations when I was young. But I didn't really have any passions. And I wasn't an entrepreneur. It's sort of like, I don't have to do this shit. You know, I don't want to start a company. It's only 50 bucks. Okay, well, I can, I can afford 50 bucks. You know, get a, uh, make an ink and things like that. So you sort of respond when you have to, I think. Not all of these things come out bang on top. These are the countries in red that I was physically able to visit during the time I was with uh, BHP. And then double that for what we do now in Condor Consulting in terms of working with data. At the end, I found my real passion was solving problems. And it's, it's a simple statement, but it's fairly broad and encompassing. The curiosity is important, but the desire to solve the problem is the proactive part of it. And so I went through my career, I still love to sit down with you physical data and try and piece the thing. My wife does crossword puzzles, I hate them. I hate jigsaw puzzles, but give me a set of expiration data and try and figure out where the ore body is sitting within that. I love that, I could do that for hours. I do it on weekends. But there's also a lot of other things that solving problems about how to deal with people issues, how to deal with company issues, you know, advice to clients. Uh, it's a business that has an enormous number of problems with sparse data. And that's probably the other critical part. There was a guy who was, uh, he was actually a mentor of Murray Hitzman's, I didn't realize that until we exchanged an email. A guy called Don Paul, who was a very senior guy with Chevron. Geophysicist, MIT, smart guy. He came to Mines, gave a talk about 10 years ago uh, to the geophysical group there, Heinlein Lunch. And because, you know, he's a big luminary and probably dumped a lot of money, Chevron did at the, at the department. All the profs were there. Don says, he says, we love exploration people. We love exploration people. They solve problems. He says, but at Chevron, we don't need exploration problems solved as much as we need all these other problems solved. We need your type of, of integrated, multidimensional thinking applied to accounting, to safety. He says, my chief geophysicist was running their venture capital group at the time. It's very interesting that if you, if you develop, if you find you have the skill sets to solve problems with sparse data, and a colleague of mine some years ago, he flipped it around and he says, how do you work with such ambiguity? How do you sit down and actually think there's an answer to something when you've got a point here and a point there and a bit of data like this? And you say, it's okay, you know, life's not going to end. You, you make your best shot and you learn, and you go on, and you build on that. And a lot of people can't do that. They get paralyzed. They say, no, I need absoluteness. I need the entire... I worked for a geologist in Reno, and he wanted more geophysics than I ever did. That's one of the reasons I left. He drove me mad. He could, never, he could never drill the hole. I was ready to stop much sooner. Now, we are in an industry blessed by some very clever people, um, a lot of them near the ends of their careers. This gentleman, Dave Lowell, recently published a book. He's got a, I'm not sure if he got to name the title of the article, but the mining.com anyway says he's the best explorer in the world. And he had a list. I mean, how many people saw, saw right, this came out like 10 days ago? Okay, two people. It's, a, it's I put the link on the stick. But there's some points here that I'm not gonna read all of them. I highlighted a few that I thought would be germane to what a, a young person looking at the business might think about. And what, how would they, got, you know, would Dave's mentoring from afar be any value? So mines are found in the field, not in the office. Okay, that's a statement of fact. High tech device, I always put that one in. Number five, high tech devices and geophysics very rarely are of value, right? Okay, thanks Dave. <laughs> you're, you're, a, you're a prince, right? But, you know, in his experience, this is the story. This is the perception. Uh, there's a lot of geologists will, will say, you really, uh, even Murray Hitzman said, what, who sees the most outcrop wins? And I said, Murray, you know better than that. You know, there's a lot of people go to an outcrop and don't see Jack. I mean, you've got to have your thinking cap on at the same time. 
Good understanding of the target, I think that's, uh, that's important and that's in part, that comes from experience. I found early on in my career that, that geologists I worked with who had worked underground had a far more intuitive sense for 3D, okay? They lived in 3D. They were actually able to see veins going from the floor up into the ceiling and they'd catch it on the next drift. They had an ability which a lot of people that are sort of flatlanders don't get, or it's much harder, or they try and get it from, from software and visualization technology. So I think, you know, whether it's Dave Lowell or people like Dick Silito, clearly these people have a gift built up over many years and a lot of experience. At the beginning, you're not going to have many years and a lot of experience, but if you can find places where you can begin that journey to understand that information, um, and he says, no, not, not looking at scientific curiosity. You know, well, well, okay. It's hard to separate the two. I guess, like I was saying about the guy in Reno, he had more scientific curiosity as opposed to exploration. At some point, you have to cut your losses. You have to move on, drill a hole, try and get an answer. Um, interesting, my last facto. Yeah, I think that got that right. Training manuals of classrooms. Yeah, write those off. Freedom to plan your own, I love that, you know, sort of, who, Dave, is going to give anybody but you, you know, a big pile of money to go and do whatever you want for the next three years. But <laughs> anyways, there's often a lot of uh, freedom, I think, to inject your ideas into processes, particularly if you're in the field part of the in, uh, play, that don't assume that the older guy or lady knows better. You know, put, put your thoughts together. So here was kind of a... Uh, hit list, um, and I had to say it was 2,500 years of advice and four bullet points. So you really savor these. Lazarus is, you know, is watching. Um, unfortunately, I found far more um, acceptance, resignation to the concept that these sort of idea of a mini careers, these three to five year periods where you would be engaged with one particular group, is. And this guy is an exploration manager, but major mining company, he says, yeah. But he also provided the caveat, he says, it looks like that's a trend in a lot of business. It's not just picking on the geoscientists. And in part, it's the impatience of the young people, and I'm not saying it's a negative thing. I mean, I, I, I was like a rock. I mean, the first 10 years, I was like, oh, okay, i carrying the IP reel, okay. I, you know, I didn't have anybody to ask, and I sort of just kept doing the job that was in front of me. Uh, people nowadays, you know, the clock cycles are ticking over a bit faster. Um, marketability, and that's of the person, right? You're, how do you stand out? Uh, this mastering of multiple skills. I mean, they, sh they, they do and they should put traditional field work, things like core logging and the mapping. Um, it was interesting, one guy who I've known for a number of years, really just, just retired, he came out of UBC in... 1974, class of 120, so bachelor's degree in geology, two of them got offers for jobs. It was him, a guy called Ross Beatty. And um, he says, now, he says, our two younger geologists, they're in, one's in his early 30s, he says, this guy until last year, so he'd been in the business since he was 18, he didn't, he'd never met. So here's a geologist who never had the opportunity to map. He, he locked core, and he, he looked at geological maps, but he had actually never put one together himself. But he had all these other skills. He was good at GIS, he managed to drill well, you know, things were safe. So, got to somehow try and fit that into the story. 3D modeling, I mean, that's part of the deposit modeling. One, uh, one, in, one client, or friend of a client, this guy looks at uh, assets that come in to make investments. And he says one of the big problems that they have now, he says we get a geological model, or we get a metallurgical model, he says they don't match. Nobody sat down and actually thought what the geology is saying and what the metallurgy is saying. And yet they just push it along and they put a 43101 on it and it becomes the gospel. And it goes to the investors and they say, hey, we've got everybody signed off. It's a, it's a load of shit. Because the people aren't spending the time, they're not letting their curiosity, if they have it, make the reconciliation that needs to be done. So 
one of the things when you're, when you're dealing with these additional skill sets, you are going to be privy to information and problems that the Dave Lowell's of the world never cared about. It was always somebody else's job. But going forward, you're going to have to look at a lot more of that integration and the final deliverable. And along with that, things like the you know, social license, the environmental aspects, and the rest of it. Chief cook and bottle washer. Much more integrated approach as opposed to having so many people that that guy is that specialist. She does that part. He does that. Soft skills, mobility, mobility. That's, that's, a, that's a trick way of saying be prepared or your family should be prepared for you to be away half the time while the children are between 0 and 10 years old. And that's what happened in my, my family. My wife basically, you know, she was a widow during the time that I, you know, went out in the field. It may be a bit better now, but it's one of those things that there's an expectation if you are going to go out into the field, whether you're mapping or talking with natives or whatever, you're going to have to have FaceTime. It all can't be done with social media, unfortunately. Um, environment, I got one that's sort of my pet peeve. Bardos has some interesting comments about the mindset of the people that run the mining industry. These are the reptilian type people in the world, right? They have their concept of the soft skills uh, are almost non-existent. So we're looking here at, at two tailings failures. Uh, last one, Samarco in Brazil. A number of people unfortunately perished in that one. Um, this is Mount Pauly. This was in BC last year. So what was the comment a senior member of the industry said about well, Mount Pauly? I'm not sure Brazil, it's kind of isolated and probably NGOs haven't gotten in there. But this appeared in our, Nash, our international magazine. So this is two weeks after it happened. And you think, you bloody moron. The fish are dying because of this. The people who live off that land feel they've been raped. And you're saying it's safe to drink? But this is the way people think in the mining business. They're very, so if you can add a realistic context to your presence, you can make a difference. Because exploration is often the front line people in the world. They go out and see things that even the, the board of directors and the chairman, I mean, of course, on the one in Brazil, the uh, managing director for BHP, of course, flew in on the G5 to, to investigate and said, we're sorry, as he should. But, you know, we have a lot of work to do in Bardos. He just says it's almost like genetic. The people that are somehow good at mining have, have never had really the ability to empathize with the rest of society. They'd rather just keep their heads down. Sorry, it's not going to work. Um, a job, a career issues. Mentoring was cited. It's very important, but it remains a challenge. Be proactive about it. The baby boomers, I think, a number of them will respond, but I find amongst my peer group of the sort of 65 that replied, I think three actually mentioned that they were mentoring somebody. So a very small number, but they're doing it. And if you go kick somebody in the shins, I think they'll try and help you. This mini career, or I call it Geo Uber, is unfortunately going to be a bit of the norm uh, until maybe the majors get their act together. And then I think they will go headhunting for people with experience that they haven't been able to give. Um, I think that's probably five to ten years out. Um, a number of people just flag timing, call it luck. They come out at a particular time or they can go back to graduate school and kind of, you know, weather the storm. Um, you know, just, however, if you really want to be in the business, I can't say you will necessarily be passionate about it at the very beginning, but at least engaged. Um, always be on the lookout. And that's kind of what I did in my career. I look back on it and I never, I never really thought I did what I did, but I could say, hey, I can see this periodicity to think something must have been happening that, that thought process in my mind anyways. As I say, there was nobody guiding me. They just say, oh, okay, well, at least, you know, that itchy feet needs to move again. Data integration, major issue and challenge and opportunity. If you can demonstrate you're good at that, 
you will have people's attention. And to the many, um, the 20, 2,500 years of experience, Graham, who's uh, uh, is a really good friend, I've, I've, I chat with him at lunches frequently about such issues, and then uh, actually Lee Freeman and Bardos co-authored the paper in 06, and there was another co-author, I apologize, I forget who it was. But Lee is definitely, he's uh, in the space of where, where the industry's going and the challenges people face. So anyways, I am finished. Yeah. Sure, I'm, that's when I'm, I'll just stand here. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke them if you got them. Sure. Um, as far as the mentorship um, things are concerned, you mentioned, you know, just kind of going into these SCG meetings and essentially just kind of putting yourself out there. Um, is there, you know, is it something that as a student you would just show up and say, hey, I'm a student and I'm really interested in this. Can you? Tell me more about it, or is it something you kind of want to be a bit more tactful about, and sort of go to a few meetings and kind of get the lay of the land, and you know know who you're talking to before you necessarily start asking names, and you know. Well, there's a, there's a couple of uh, they actually have. I'm not totally sure of the details. I don't know Russell, but they have an actual group of people who have, have offered themselves up as mentors, and they probably that advantage would be. They would say, I know a lot about porphyry coffers in Chile, or I know a lot about uh, you know, magnetic nickel deposits and yeah. things like that. So you could kind of target that way, as opposed to chance striking up a conversation okay. with somebody. Um, you know, I would say use every means of research. I mean, one, um, you know, you listen to a talk that you, you like somebody's presentation. Um, I mean, some of the things you probably want guidance on, you know, some of the baby boomers. They were probably quite good technically, but they may not organizationally. They, they've probably been in environments that are different than what you're facing now. Yeah. So you may actually have to kind of find, you know, somebody maybe 10 years older than you for some sort of career aspects, but you find an older guy or lady, lots of good knowledge on the technical side of it. Yeah. Okay. Kind of ba balance it out that way. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is a master's level education typically required to get into the exploration industry, or are there opportunities at the undergraduate level um, with like the zero to five year experience? Yeah, um, I guess if you could get a bachelor's degree and then go out and get some basic experience. I mean, I, I helped a guy, came out of, I think it was Indiana about three years ago. Uh, he had a master's degree. Uh, but he didn't have any field experience, and I, at that time, I was able to pull a bunch of my colleagues, and and he got a job up in Wyoming for for two years working on a project up there with Clinton, and um, um, then then that ended, and now he's up with Hecla, at a, at one of their mines in Alaska. So he's gotten himself, which is no, what a number of the 2,500 years folks said, get a job in an operation because their money's being produced. And if you can add value, you're going to learn something, and you're going to have a job, and you're, you're going to start. The thing is, of course, the job is at the mine, right? Um, and you may feel it's on the back side of the moon, but you know, take it as the mini career thing. Do the 18 or two years and learn what you can. It's interesting, in Bardos' description, he says, expertise takes 10,000 hours and five years to basically become knowledgeable, and it's sort of like, How's that going to work? <laughs> there were, nobody's going to have enough time to go through all of that. So you're going to have to high grade what you need. Maybe mentors will help you supplement some of it. I won't say you've got to shine your way through uh, things, but I mean, you are going to have to approach it differently. You're not going to be able to spend, although one of my colleagues with Cameco said, we're still looking at eight to 10 years is sort of the amount of time they want somebody to be trained. And whether it's a bachelor's degree might be a bit thin, but if you go and get some practical experience and then maybe come back and take the, the master's, I think you've got a much higher velocity when you finish that to come into the industry. Rather than finishing your master's and then say, oh crap, what do I do? Should I have done it? Because the other thing that that experience early on, it helps reality check. Is this something you really want to do? I know my, my, my sweet mother, 
when I finished my fourth year and I'd worked the summer. And she says, well, Kenny, she also called me Kenny, she says, you know, this, this field, this stuff, it's all great when you're going to school, but when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> Mom? Yeah, right. She didn't know what it really was. So. But it would be good for you to know if there's really something you want to, you know, try and develop those beginnings from moving from opportunity to four fifty a month to something more solid. You say, yeah, I can see, because it does offer so much. I mean, there's so many people... Whether they're dentists or... That's what I put in my yearbook in high school, right? I had to have a name, so I put it to be a dentist. <laughs> you know. I love my dentist, but it's not something I would ever wish on anybody. <laughs> hey? Yeah, um, I was also curious about... Um, I guess something I feel like I've noticed is that as the economy gets worse, the market for metals and, and the prices tend to get better. Um, is that something you notice with contract work? Is that in a, in a down economy, the work becomes better as prices, as prices rise? Or do you see any kind of correlation with that at all? Yeah, I mean, investors are, are fickle. Um, major companies, of course, are supposed to have strategic plans. But as, as I recall, when I was with BHP in Australia, the, the petroleum group was going through a very tough time of it. And the guy said, how can we have a strategic plan when we change it every 18 months? So large companies give lip service to long-term thinking, but they often find it very difficult to, uh, because the world doesn't operate yet. Smaller companies driven by investors, they tend to be much more the punters, people that are the, you know, call it the creep factor. They, they want to, you know, if they see, they see a chance to, because they don't need production. Yeah. They need a movement in the stock to basically give them a, a lift some excitement and, and so they can go up that and you know many you know it's been studied a lot how junior stocks go up and they drop after you know after good results often is a big depression because people have said well we tapped into the upside now you know Christ you've got to wait three years and they may you know do some heat bleach or something like that so it's uh, uh, it is somewhat counter cyclic do you, I guess do you see it then that in a, in a worse economy that job prospect with a junior is a lot better than with a, with a major? Well, it, it should be that the majors provide, they, they, what, what's, what happened in that 10-year in that, uh, period by, by proxy was that the, a lot of the majors started uh, using juniors as straw men to basically go and do exploration for them. But then they found out that the juniors often didn't find the things the majors wanted. So when that started to kind of come to the forefront with their very tiny reptilian brains, they started to say, shit, we better start doing exploration again. Some like Rio Tinto never stopped, okay? And First Quantum never stopped. They've, down, they've downscaled it, but they still have a vision of its importance. Groups like BHP are, are inching their way back because they could, I mean, I'm sure if you looked at their Expiration group and petroleum, it's probably 50 times the size and the money that's spent in minerals. But as Escondida, you know, she's been a great deposit, but that wears out. You're gonna, you want to find a replacement. And of course, they had resolution and they had Oya Tolgoy, but they made some, this one of the managing directors said, we made some poor decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can't, it can be counter cyclic. I think the thing is, Develop a network, you know, find it. we find that on our commercial side, you know, as I made a joke earlier, our, our clients can't read, you know, well, they make decisions really <coughs> almost the morning that they need an answer. Just like, they'll, hey, who got the, call the Ghostbusters, we've got a problem, right, you know? And they, it's like, man, I've been here, I've been standing here, you know, for months or years, going to conferences, and, but they really, it's very short term. If you, if, you can, if you can land in the right spot at the right time, you know, you'll you'll be you'll be snapped up. Cool. Yep. Hey. How important would you say remote sensing is to geophysical and geochemistry uh, data? And how do you feel about the long-term viability of um, economic? Um, Products such as like dimension stone or riprap stuff that's you know oh right consistently used and isn't subject to such uh, 
market ups and downs? Yeah. Um, hey, it's it's all fair game, right? You know, the old line is if you can't grow it, you got to mine it. So um, the, the the biggest mining in the states is is uh, sand and gravel, right? For the cement business and the mafia. But anyways, that's uh, <laughs> uh, you know you know you can. You, you could do that on the side and, and fund your own exploration company if you wanted. You just say, well, I, I make my money doing this bit, and I understand it, uh, and there's an opportunity. Because that's often the thing is that, you know, using your ability to, to bridge those synoptic gaps and say, hey, nobody's actually doing this. And if, right now they bring this 150 miles away, but I can bring it from 30 miles away, and it's all about energy costs for moving the product. You, you can be there. Remote sensing, it's interesting, well, I'll say interesting. The big, whoa, the big, um, the big thing hitting expiration, and I don't really understand it, I think Russell might know a little more about it, but this hyperspectral on core, it's to me another giant amount of data that almost nobody seems to understand what they're going to do with it all, except guys who write computer programs, right? It's all going to be algorithms, right? So you're going to be standing there, uh, drill here, and it's going to come up on your little you know, power book or whatever. Lab at the rig, anybody heard of that? The Australians are coming up with directional drilling, and they're going to be doing real-time analysis at the drill rig. Right, so very exciting. More big data. So remote sensing, there's, there's still you know, the traditional satellite and a little bit of aircraft-based stuff. Probably drones will fit into that box before too long if we can fly them safely. Um, so yeah, I would say there's a lot of people that make money doing really weird stuff so they can pursue their passion. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shit. So now, the big push in spending that you were showing on your graph towards the end of uh, like 2010, there was yeah. a bit of spending and exploration. How much of that would be in like emerging technologies? Because I was noticing, you know, the, the 90s and early 2000s, they didn't spend much. And in you know, the 2000s, there's been a lot of technology developed with computers. Yeah, and the... Drones, like you mentioned. Right. I um, understand, of course, the juniors basically just have to go into the yellow pages. I mean, they don't have the resources of the people to really adopt new technologies. There is the closest thing. There's one junior with a couple of older gold mines in Quebec doing what they call the, the gold challenge, the Integra group. Maybe some of you have heard of that. It's another crowdsourcing contest. So they're not really embarking on any real technological thing other than getting a crowdsourcing approach to trying to solve their geological problem. Majors historically have been the ones, but most of their technology money, I, from what I can see, is now on the downstream productivity side. You know, like Rio Tinto and BHP are introducing driverless ore trucks in Newman, okay? Now, how much does a frickin' truck driver cost? I mean, I know out of Fort McMurray, it's like $100,000 a year. <sighs> the trucks were so good, right? And they start off, they made ruts, because the GPS had them going within millimeters of the same track each time. There was no variability, because the guy was, you know... Scratching his butt and the rest of it. So they had to change the software so they'd go not make ruts. So uh, underground mining, I mean, uh, uh, Rio Tinto is looking at uh, the resolution is a great deposit. It's the best undeveloped porphyry in, in North America, apart from Pebble, I guess in the US. But it's like 65 degrees Fahrenheit? Centigrade. centigrade. It's really hot, so they're, they're probably going to have to have autonomous mining equipment. And they have, they've got a major research program at the University of Sydney, they're working with the Brits, developing a whole range of technologies to allow them to mine in places that are very hostile to people, be very expensive. So, yeah, that, that's, on exploration front, we're kind of, uh, they really rely a lot on the service industry, the, the geochemical labs, the geophysical service companies, I mean, our group, we're trying to innovate, you know, in our space as much as we can, show stuff to clients on, you know, conferences and things. So, but we're not, you know, it's not IBM, it's not General Electric, that's for sure, it's not Google. Would you say the methodology is pretty much the same as when you first started consulting? Yeah. The data, the quality and the data volumes have increased enormously. But the physics of the whole story is pretty much the same. 
There is one group up at UBC, they're experimenting with the muon technology, which is kind of cool. It can actually, if you put this down in, a, say, a mine shaft, down like a kilometer or you know, a mile or so, and leave it there for a couple of months. You have to have a mine shaft, right? You can't put it down a borehole. It can actually give you a, a 3D picture of all the density within about a kilometer and a half of that sensor. So if you're mining and you've got time and you have access, you can actually employ a pretty cool thing that didn't exist when I was going to school. I mean, muons existed, they've existed for a long time, but nobody actually had a, a means to uh, measure them effectively. But other than that, we're dealing with the pretty much same scribble of, of techniques as we've always had. They've just gotten, we can see a bit deeper, but we get a lot more data. Yep. So since you said the major companies employ a lot less people, obviously a lot of that has to do with technology, um, but have you seen a large number of consultants come up because of that to fill those gaps? Um, it's most of the consultants, very few of them are, are under 40. They try and, and hang on inside large companies or what they, what in, in the geophysical world, many of them work for service companies. So they'll go out and acquire data, they'll go out and build systems, they'll go out and do marketing. So they're still within the overall exploration business. Unfortunately, geologists tend not to have that diversity of skills. If they're not out looking for an ore body, they're off or, or uh, ornamental stone, they're kind of discovered because really their passion is really to go and find a deposit. Whereas geophysicists tend to be a little more lateral thinking when it comes to, to careers. And sometimes it means you don't have to travel as much. Uh, sometimes you travel more. So actually, I wouldn't say technology has replaced a lot of people in the industry. It's much more just a contraction, less activity. The thing, the worrisome thing for the majors as, as the juniors is that 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 scorecard isn't very impressive in terms of what's found. And so a lot of them, I think, are taking a deep breath and thinking, okay, maybe we need, if we, if we rehydrate the exploration again, we're going to have to look at it more like the oil industry and just rebuild it in a different way. Just trying to do it like it was back, you know, 15 years ago. I won't say that's a recipe for, for continued modest returns, but it's, I wouldn't put it as a good way to invest in money. We just haven't. We had the best opportunity and a lot of money and a lot of drilling was done. Costs went up, uh, which worries a lot of people. Um, but that was just in part people taking advantage of the whole thing too. So I think more technology will there be there and people who can integrate it. Uh, and I think the geologists are the best people to do that. The geophysicists, by and large, would rather run models. They'd rather do inversions. They'd rather measure millivolts and things like that. There's not that many, and even the ones in large companies, most of their time is spent on occupation, health and safety, monitoring contracts. It's all the stuff associated with exploration, because there's so few of them. We know we do in condo. We, we probably do five times more interpretive work than any major geophysicist inside a major company, because they're like one guy in one office, one lady in another, they're all just reporting to their peers and their management most of the time. Just don't have, so they're not really contributing to the exploration process. They're making it effective, but exploration is about being, um, um, sorry, it's, it's efficient, but it's, it's gotta be effective. Saving money in exploration is an oxymoron, right? That's, but that's what a lot of people view it as, is how do we spend as little as possible, and of course, we do it safely. Can't get away from that. So the blue screen of death, so, just, we'll take that as the last question. All right, good. Thank you very much.